Summer Lynn from Chicago, Illinois. Just wanted to give a huge shout out to the Relay for all the love and support they've given my team and I. And make sure you stay tuned for all the latest boxing news. Welcome to the motherfucking Relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Well, the details of Feruza Sharapova's next bout have been revealed. 25-year-old Feruza Sharapova will be squaring off against Tanzanian fighter Happy Doughty on August 15th in Sochi, Russia, in a 10-round bout for the IBA female light welterweight title. 240 pounds. Given that Sharapova has been out of the ring since April of 2019, we can understand her having an easy bout, but this might be a bit too easy. Dowdy has never been in a bout scheduled for more than six rounds. She has never previously fought outside of Tanzania, and she has been stopped in four of her six losses. She has also, notably, never beaten an opponent with a recorded win. I want to say that even though Feruza Sharapova's next fight is going to be at 140 pounds, I don't think she's going to stay there too long. I think it's a situation similar to the Savannah Marshall situation. Savannah Marshall's very next fight is going to be at light heavyweight. That fight is for a full-fledged world title against the reigning world champion, Giovanna Perez. But in spite of it being a title fight, I don't see Savannah staying up there as there really isn't a whole lot for Savannah to do at 175. The scarcity of opponents. Because of that, if and when Savannah Marshall wins, I expect she will move back down. Something very similar applies here to Feruza, although it's not due to a scarcity of opponents. You know, there are some good, interesting fights and interesting fighters in the 140-pound division for Feruza to explore, but Feruza, Too small. I'm not sure, is cut out for this weight. Feruza's not that big a kid, not that big a puncher. 140 pounds. Too high. I think that has more to do with the time off, the fact that she hasn't fought since 2019, so she's going to be coming in a little heavy, and once she gets back in the swing of things, she will move down. She'll likely move down to lightweight, maybe even super featherweight. For more reasons than one. 140 pounds is a risky division for someone like Feruza Sharapova to campaign in, as there are bigger girls with a bigger punch than what she's got running around up there. Talking about Cristina Linares the two, Jessica McCaskill, Chantel Cameron, Mary McGee, Eva Pietzkowska, Kali Reese. Some big girls. Some big punchers. Bigger than Feruza. So I don't imagine Feruza's gonna stay up there very long. I imagine she's gonna move down to a weight she is more adequately suited to campaign in. Moreover, a weight that yields bigger financial opportunities. Here today, both the lightweight and super featherweight divisions, they've been getting a lot of attention. They're on fire. There's a lot of talent, but there's also a lot of opportunity. Now at 135, you have what is arguably the most lucrative fight for any fighter at or around these weights. I'm talking about the Katie Taylor fight. The thing is that Katie's booked and she's likely gonna stay booked for a while. We're talking about at least the next two, maybe even three fights. If she makes it past Delphine Pursun, there's a potential Cecilia Breakers fight waiting for her thereafter. It's not likely that Feruza Sharapova gets a crack at Katie anytime in the near future. Which brings us to the super featherweight division, a more open division with more opponent options. Talking about Eva Brodnika, talking about Terry Harper, talking about Maeva Hamadouche, talking about Yumi Choi. And that's just the world champions. There's a host of contenders that also serve us as potential opponent options. You're talking about Michaela Mayer. You're talking about Alicia Baumgartner. You're talking about Tiara Brown. There's a lot more options for her at super featherweight. And overall, it's a better weight for one with the physical dimensions of a Feruza Sharapova. I imagine if she gets past Happy Doughty August 15th, provided the fight comes off and there aren't any unforeseen circumstances, she'll likely move back down to 130 pounds. It's a better weight for her that yields more options. Was it 135 pounds? The best fight the division has to offer is a Katie Taylor fight, but I reiterate, Katie Taylor's booked. And the most I can think of for Feruza to do at 135 pounds is, I don't know, try to become a mandatory challenger for one of Katie's belts. Maybe you decide to take on the WBA's interim champion, the mandatory to the full title, Miriam Gutierrez of Spain. I don't know, maybe you get that girl on the phone, maybe you have a fight with her, see if you can beat her, see if you can line yourself up for a Taylor fight. The bottom line here is, even though Feruza is returning on August 15th against Happy Doughty of Tanzania, things really aren't going to get interesting for Feruza until after that. 
well after that when she gains some steam, gains some momentum. So for now, keep your eyes peeled for the return of Feruza Sharapova in Sochi, Russia, August 15th. Moving on. Yesterday, Angelo Leo saw himself becoming the WBO's 122-pound champion when he squared off against stand-in Tremaine Williams. Tremaine was standing in for Stephen Fulton, who, as you all may or may not know, tested positive for COVID-19. And for what it's worth, Angelo looked good out there. He looked the part. You know, he applied a lot of pressure on Tremaine Williams, went to the body, won a decisive victory. That's the most that you can ask the kid to do in this situation. As a result, he is now the WBO's 122-pound champion. But it's one of those situations that is created by the inner workings, the infrastructure of boxing to where, you know, somebody's got to be the WBO champion now that Emmanuel Navarrete has moved up in weight, and that somebody is Angelo Leo. Right. But Angelo Leo himself is not all that proven at this weight. I mean, I liked what I saw from the kid last night. He did look the part. But against who? Tremaine Williams? Tremaine's not a top 10 fighter at this weight, you know. Stephen Fulton is. And while it's in no way, shape, or form Angelo Leo's fault that Stephen Fulton tested positive for COVID-19 and had to stand down so that Tremaine Williams would ultimately stand in, Stephen Fulton, had it been him that Angelo Leo fought and beat, well, that would have been a better barometer for just how good Angelo is or how good Angelo isn't. It would have told us more about this fighter. He's beating Tremaine Williams don't tell us much. It doesn't tell me that you're ready for an MJ Akhmadaliev. It doesn't tell me that you're ready for a Ray Vargas, the longest reigning champion at this weight. And it doesn't tell me that you're ready for a Daniel Roman, who very recently crossed over to the PBC side of things. That's a fight they can make. Try and understand. I'm not attempting to diminish Angelo Leo's victory over Tremaine Williams. I'm just adding context to it that Tremaine wasn't all that proven at this weight. Neither is Angelo, so one guy beating the other. Don't tell me that either one of them is ready for those guys, those upper echelon fighters. Tremaine Williams at best is a, I don't know what, top 15, maybe top 20, 122 pound fighter in the division? Yeah, around there. Not a top 10 and he's not a top 5 guy. And until those are the kind of fighters that Angelo Leo is fighting, I'm just not going to know who he really is. The good news is that all systems seem to be a go for the Stefan Fulton fight. And that is a more intriguing matchup than what we got last night because Stefan Fulton, unlike Tremaine Williams, is a top 10 fighter at this weight. And this will tell us more about Angelo Leo. And if I'm being honest... I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if we got two fights out of this thing. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, once negotiations are underway, a rematch clause is stipulated for Angelo Leo in the event that he loses. He can exercise it and challenge, cool boy stuff. you know, Stephen Fulton for the title, assuming Stefan wins it. The PBC's got a good little situation down there at 122. They've got Angelo Leo, they've got Stefan Fulton, they've got Daniel Roman, and they have Ray Vargas. I could see a round-robin situation going on between the PBC's 122-pound fighters. It's not a bad situation. The only drawback of all of this, the only drawback of a potential in-house PBC round-robin situation is that, in all likelihood, MJ Akhmadaliev is going to be frozen out. I don't see any of the PBC's fighters fighting that fucking guy, even though he's holding two of the four major titles at the weight. I just don't see it happening. I get it. So long as the PBC has one or two fighters, of their own fighters, I should say, to match against each other, they will isolate themselves from the rest of the weight class. And in this weight class, unlike some others, they actually happen to have two reigning world champions. You know, it's not like that round robin they got going on in the light heavyweight division. You know, between Bob Jack and Marcus Brown, John Pascal. Those guys are all fighting for a fucking baby belt. That's what they're fighting for. That's what they're doing. At least here, we're talking about two major titles. The WBO title and potentially the WBC title. Ray Vargas' title. That's right. I mean, he's got to be in that conversation. He's got to be in the mix of things because if he's not, I, I don't know what the hell he's doing. So... To surmise my thoughts on Angelo Leo becoming the WBO champion at this weight, it's just a situation to where, you know, the title went vacant and somebody had to snatch it up and that somebody was you. But that in and of itself doesn't tell me how good you are. It was a solid performance.
perform. And the kid's got some upside. He's unbeaten and he's only 26 years old. So here's looking forward to what else we might see from Angelo Leo, the newly crowned WBO 122 pound champion. Here's looking forward to what the future has to offer. And finally, former pound for pound king, Roy Jones Jr. says Errol Spence must beat Terence Crawford to prove he's the best. Roy was quoted as saying, they both have something special that makes you want to see what they do next. A lot of people took it wrong when I said I like Crawford. I give Crawford the edge over Errol right now. They say, why did you say that? Because Errol hadn't fought anybody that we could measure him to because Crawford had fought people. Don't tell Spence's fans that. I wasn't saying it's guaranteed that Crawford would beat Errol. No, we haven't seen Errol against the type of competition that Crawford has gone against yet. So it's hard to judge and say he has the goods. To me, he seems like he has the good, said Jones about Spence. And I want to see the fight. I know that great fighters turn up against great fighters. So I want to see him, Spence, face the best. I think they'll bring the best out of each other, but right now, Crawford's opposition outweighs Errol's opposition. The Sean Porter fight was a good fight with Spence. Kel Brook did dominate Sean Porter, but Sean Porter and Errol Spence was a good fight. It was a very good fight. That's why I'm saying that I've seen Crawford longer than Errol, said Jones Jr. Crawford has been dominating for a long time, Jones said. Errol just came upon the scene now, but I need to see him do more definitive things that give him the edge after a few more fighters. Then I'll say, okay, now you can fight. It looks like an even fight now, but because of Crawford's reputation and he's been dominating for so long, I've got to give the edge to Crawford. Now, I'm not saying that guaranteed Crawford wins the fight. I'm just saying what I've seen. I have to lean towards Crawford. That's what I'm saying. I wasn't saying that Errol can't beat Crawford. Well, I am. I wasn't saying that I like Crawford more than Errol. They're both good fighters. Crawford has been around longer. You don't take a guy that has been around that long and proven himself and say, oh, this guy is going to beat him. How could you say that? I don't know that. I haven't seen this guy, Roy Jones Jr. said. Crawford's ring record, at least according to the author of this article, says Chris Williams. Crawford's ring record doesn't back up what Jones Jr. says about him having a better resume than Spence. That's the whole problem. No, the problem is that the author of this article is more into window dressing than actual resumes because as far as resumes go, it's not a contest. Terrence Crawford has in fact been in more world title fights than Errol Spence by a wide margin. He's beaten more active reigning world champions than Errol Spence by at least two times. Yeah. Errol Spence has beaten two world champions in Kell Brook and Sean Porter, whereas Terrence Crawford has beaten four. Three of which were undefeated. Ricky Burns, Victor Pastal, Julius Ndongo, Jeff Horn. Look, we've done this already. We actually have. In reference to Roy Jones Jr.'s assessment of these two fighters and what their fight will look like, how things break down, we've actually discussed this in a previous video. And I'll leave the link to that video in the description box. box because box, in this box. video, what I want to cover is a different angle of it. He broke down their resumes already. I could sit here and tell you that Terrence Crawford has been in 14, count them, 14 world title fights. 14 fights where a world title was on the line to Errol Spence's five title fights. Just five? Just five! I could tell you that Terrence Crawford has been involved in nothing but world title fights since 2014. That's roughly six years. Six years to Harold Spence, who didn't start fighting in world title fights till a couple of years later in 2017. As far as competing at this level, Terence Crawford really has been at it longer. I could tell you that, though I shouldn't have to. You take the author of this article here, a guy who goes by the name of Chris Williams, and I guess Chris Williams knows something about boxing that Roy Jones Jr. doesn't, because when Roy Jones Jr. is telling you that Crawford's been at this a lot longer than Spence, Apparently, Chris knows better. Apparently, Chris disagrees. He says Crawford hasn't fought anybody. As opposed to the guys that Errol Spence has fought so far, right? Right. Fat, lightweight Mikey Garcia, who Spence couldn't knock out. A very broken Kel Brook. Don't forget Carlos Ocampo. A guy who mostly fought domestic-level competition in Mexico before he fought Errol Spence. He actually never fought outside of Mexico before he fought Errol Spence. You see, what passes for A-level competition... In a guy like Chris Williams' mind, the guy who wrote this article, the guy questioning Terrence Crawford's quality of competition, 
instead of questioning Errol Spence's quality of competition. What passes for A-level competition in a guy like Chris Williams' mind, the average Errol Spence fanboy, is familiarity, familiar names. It's not so much about the fighters and who they were and where they were coming from at the time that Errol Spence fought them, so much as their marquee value and familiarity. Oh, you're more familiar with a Mikey Garcia than you are with a Victor Postal or a Julius Ndongo. Yeah, because you've seen Mikey more times. But having seen Mikey more times or being more familiar with Mikey Garcia than those fighters isn't going to make Mikey Garcia a full-fledged welterweight. Rather, it's not going to rewrite history. It's not going to change the past. Mikey Garcia came up from 135 to 147, and he was vastly unproven, unprepared for that fight with Errol Spence. And Mikey's marquee value has absolutely nothing to do with his ability to fight at 147 pounds. It just doesn't. Now, a guy like Chris Williams... You're the one saying Errol fought better, guys. Based on what? Based on what exactly? Familiarity? Your familiarity with Mikey Garcia? Or the length of Kell Brook's hospital bill after the Golovkin fight? What exactly does a guy like Chris Williams use to measure the skill of these fighters? Do you think that Chris Williams knows the difference between a flick jab and a stiff jab? No. A step jab, a power jab? Do you think he actually knows how to distinguish all of these different variations of the same punch. Of course, he's assessing A's from B's and B's from C's. And on what premise? Familiarity? Marquee value? Your recollection of what's on a fighter's resume? You're assessing their skills after all. You're saying that Crawford fought B and C level fighters. What makes them B and C level fighters? You know what foot feints are. Can you tell me what distinguishes an educated jab from a lazy jab, as they say? And what makes a lazy jab a lazy jab? Can you do that for me? Are you call world, world champions B and C level fighters, Mr. Jack Blackburn? What's it mean when they say you turn the guy? What's a lead right hand? What's a lead left hook? I mean, surely you know. Whilst you run around calling reigning world champions, three of which were undefeated, B and C level fighters. So how do you deal with a guy with right head movement? What exactly does it mean to cut the ring off? And how does cutting the ring off differ from simply following your opponent around? What distinguishes one from the other? Surely you know the answer. I mean, if you haven't caught on already to what I'm getting at, it's very simple. It's that Errol Spence's core supporters, his biggest fans, guys like Chris Williams, they can't answer none of these questions because these guys don't know boxing. What they know is what they're told. These are guys who don't know Rex Lane from Rex Ryan. <laughs> these are guys who don't know Bob Foster from Bob Arum. So I'm going to listen to your assessment of a fighter and his grade as opposed to the assessment of Roy fucking Jones Jr.? Is that what we're doing now? Oh, because you know something he doesn't. Look, I'll tell you the truth. I don't normally go by anybody's anecdotes, but if I have to go by somebody's anecdotes, I'd sooner go with Roy's long before I'd go with yours because you clearly don't know what the fuck you're talking about.